Welcome to Season 2 of Sessions by The Herb Life. My name is Tiana, your friendly sessions facilitator, and we are back for Season 2 with a new lineup of people who have made cannabis their business. Between advocates, industry professionals, influencers, and creatives, we'll be showcasing some of the industry's best and brightest in a new episode every Thursday. Speaking of best and brightest, I'd like to give a special shout out to Sundial Cannabis, the natural alternative for modern wellness, without whom session season two wouldn't be possible. As a special thank you to Sundial, we've decided to kick off the season with two of their very own. Now, this episode, we welcome Laura Dole and Candice Johnson, two exceptionally intelligent women who will spend this session blowing your mind about grow science and, of course, the regulations that licensed producers need to adhere to in this new legal framework. I'll warn you, this episode is fairly advanced. I had to do some serious Googling on the different terminology around pesticides and beneficial bugs, but if you're considering growing your own plants at home or are interested in learning about what you can do to ensure your plants are healthy, this is a really great episode. They talk a lot about the integrated crop management and pest management systems, which is a high-level system for crop protection that uses biological, environmental, mechanical and chemical treatments to keep healthy plants free from disease and insects. It's an incredibly interesting subject that sheds a light on how large cannabis grows protect their plants from some of the typical ailments While cannabis is certainly a new and thriving industry, it is also an agricultural one. And we have, of course, been honing our agricultural skills for quite some time with the foods we eat. For me, the best part is we rarely get to see women represented in sciences, in all industries, not just the cannabis industry. So I highly value any opportunity to give a platform to women in this space who are working with and developing technologies to enhance our cannabis experience. Interestingly, Candace actually came from early learning in childhood development, which apparently transitions quite well into cannabis. She works as a lead in integrated crop management at the research and development facility, where she uses education and instinct to work with growers to ensure happy, healthy plants from clone to harvest. Laura, on the other hand, comes to cannabis in a less surprising manner, having completed a BA in science with a major in plant science, so she's worked in large-scale greenhouses for decades. But of course, in the spirit of cannabis, when I delved deeper into Laura's background, it turns out she's an exceptionally talented artist as well, having won a Greenpeace contest in Canada for her painting titled Save the Great Bear Rainforest. Now, if I were interviewing Laura, I definitely would have asked whether cannabis plays a role in inspiring her artwork, but maybe you can do it for me instead if you reach out to her on Twitter. So without further ado, I will pass it over to Candice and Laura, two very impressive women in the cannabis space. Thank you to The Herb Life for having us do this podcast today. My name is Laura Dole, and welcome, Candice Johnson. Thank you, Laura. I'm so glad to be doing this because we feel that the world needs to know more about ICM, especially with indoor cannabis. Do you agree, Candice? Absolutely. So, Laura, I've listened to several podcasts uh, on the topic of IPM and ICM, and today I would like you to just talk about the down and dirty, very general, basic IPM and ICM for cannabis. IPM and ICM mean anything to do with plant virus, plant disease, or pest insects attacking the crop. So IPM stands for integrated pest management, while ICM stands for integrated crop management. So for example, ICM would apply to the plants that are grown up in the space station and the plants grown indoors in the Arctic, as well as, for example, indoor cannabis groves, while IPM applies to um, blueberry crops outside, dealing with starlings, eating the berries, and various greenhouses with screens or without screens being a closed system greenhouse, but that would be an example of IPM. So Laura, you said that IPM uh, started more than 20 years ago. Can you tell me a little bit about the origin? Yeah, for sure. So um, a long time ago, vegetable greenhouses uh, started using 
chemicals to deal with their pest insects repeatedly. So when the pathogens and pests started building up resistance to the repeated chemical use, um, everyone started to realize that they needed better and more diverse tools. So essentially, that was the beginning of IPM. Uh, starting about 20 years ago, all the um, growers started to realize that if they integrated the tools that they had between environmental controls, um, chemical controls, and biocontrols, they would have an effective integrated pest management or crop management program to defend their plants. So we uh, are familiar with herbicides and pesticides. Everyone in Alberta spraying Roundup on the dandelions on our front lawns. Everybody in Alberta putting out powder to prevent ants in and outside of our homes. So why don't we talk a bit about biocontrols? Okay, I think that the top three pest insects for indoor grown cannabis would probably be um, aphid, uh, thrip, and spider mite. But I'll talk about all the other ones too um, near the end, like things like root aphid and, you know, other things like botrytis and powdery mildew and fungus and all the good stuff. So let's start with aphid. Uh, there are so many different species of aphid around the world. And in a nutshell, I try to explain that you have to match the parasitoid with the aphid. So for example, if there's a large wild boar out in front of a cat, it, the cat can eat the wild boar if someone cuts it up into little pieces and serves it in a bowl, but otherwise the, the cat can't really eat the wild boar. Um, but the cougar can. So if you match a cougar to the wild boar and the cat to the mouse, it will be effective. And the same rule applies to aphid. If the aphid is large, you need a larger uh, parasitoid wasp. Now, you don't only um, use uh, parasitoid wasps in indoor cannabis to, um, uh, for your biocontrols for aphid. You can also use Adalia, which is the ladybug larva. Those guys are the unsung heroes of the ladybug world. Everyone gives credit to the ladybug, but really it's their offspring that do all the work. So everybody is familiar with a ladybug, but can you tell me about your parasitoid wasp? Because when I hear wasp, I think of uh, those jerk face insects in the park with a giant hive and keep your kids away or they'll get stung. So what is a parasitoid? Okay, so in the biocontrol world, there are these tiny little flies and I don't want to use words like stingers or anything like that um, because I don't want to create any, um, I don't want to paint a picture of these things at all having any interaction with humans. These insects uh, have only one interest and that's to find the aphid within the area that they can literally give a little poke to. And then what happens is the inside of that aphid body morphs uh, into what I would call a good guy. So put another way, the aphid turns into a parasitic wasp through the mummification of the parasitoid inside. How you can tell this has happened is the parasitoid, when it's ready to hatch, if you will, it will cut a perfectly circular hole out of the top of the mummified aphid body and emerge when it's ready. Um, thereby adding another good guy to your biocontrol. Um, a, a really good analogy that I like to give people when I'm explaining this story is the movie called The Alien. It's exactly like that. So you have only, in this case, the human becomes the aphid and the alien becomes the good guy. So uh, the, in the movie, the human is parasitized by the, the alien and then um, the alien grows inside the human body and when it's ready, it literally emerges through the chest cavity and it's absolutely horrific, but it's exactly what happens in the aphid parasitoid wasp world. So it's interesting that we have learned what the parasitoids can do to help us get to harvest to control aphid populations. 
Now, how about we talk about what we can do as growers to help the biocontrols that we purchase be more effective and do their job better? That's a great idea. Yes. Okay. So with the indoor cannabis grows, there are so many fans and the parasitoids aren't great flyers. So you can turn your fans down, you know, assuming that you don't have something like uh, a mildew threat or something like that. Um, you can ensure that the temperatures aren't um, too low or too high. And most importantly, make sure that your relative humidity isn't below, say, about 65%, because most biocontrols will require a higher humidity, a higher relative humidity. So, in fact, most of your biocontrols will begin experiencing a percentage of death as the relative humidity dips below 65. The lower the relative humidity goes, um, the greater disadvantage it is to your biocontrols. In fact, some you shouldn't even put in if you're running a, a 50 degrees, uh, sorry, a 50% relative humidity or so. And this conversation is very timely because it has been on CTV news about the excessive aphid population in both BC and Alberta this year. So where have these aphids come from? Generally, there are trade winds that come from the east or the south, from the states or eastern Canada. And one day you have absolutely nothing. And the next day you see the fields and the skies above the fields swarming with aphids, thrips, and spider mite. So now that we've talked about aphid, let's talk about thrip. In my experience, uh, low thresholds of thrip are manageable with biocontrols. Yeah, that's where biocontrols really shine, is when they're controlling populations of thrip. As long as you do it preventatively and um, well, you should not have a thrip problem. Um, we have some excellent biocontrols for thrip. Those are Aureus, the pirate bug. They'll do all stages of the thrip. They have a sword for a mouse part. They walk up to the victim and just pierce him and start eating his face off, basically. It's quite violent. And then there are um, a, a series of really good um, predatory mites like Swirsky or Cucumerus. If you're growing in cooler temperatures, use Cucumerus. If you um, have a higher thrip population and you're growing warmer, use uh, Swirsky. And you should not have a problem. And just keep in mind that the, the threshold for thrip um, is a lot higher. You can handle a general population throughout the year and you shouldn't be bothered by it. So I hope that no one out there is panicked over a, a thrip population. Well, all of our home growers can breathe a sigh of relief. So at Sundial, I have never experienced a problem with spider mite, but why don't we talk about spider mites? Yes, spider mite, the buzzword. Well, they're very easy. All you have to do is add Persimilis. It's a predatory mite. They're faster than spider mite. They walk right up to them and eat them alive. But if we're going to talk about the other pest insects that uh, can attack your plants, um, meaning things like root aphid, white fly, looper, fungus gnat, russet mite, mealybug, um, we'll cut to the chase and tell you what to do with that. So for root aphid, you should... Um, sanitize and clone off, sanitize and cull, sanitize and clone off until you're rid of it. Um, there are th things that we can touch on later, like um, uh, botanic gardens such that you can use, but I, I think that they're relatively ineffective compared to sanitizing and cloning and culling. And um, for white fly, you can use Incarcia and Eremoceros. They come on little cards that you hang on the plants. Um, if you're in higher temperatures, go for the Eremoceros again. If lower temperatures, go for Incarcia. Be sure to keep your relative humidity high. The higher, the better for those ones. And Laura, sorry, uh, Incarcia and Eremoceros, those are biocontrols, correct? Yeah, those are parasitic wasps as well. They're super tiny, like, like the dot of a pen. It's really hard to see with your naked eye. So you want to put those under the microscope to look at them. They're really interesting. And for looper, you should probably just pick them off by hand because there's nothing effective to spray. You could spray BT, but again, it's not very effective. Um, you could also use uh, praying mantids for 